welcome back to another episode of your Divine Glow podcast. It is your girl, Ashley Conyers. I am the Divine Glow coach. I'm a mindset coach that guides professionals to rewrite their stories through purpose-driven entrepreneurship. And today I have a special guest in the building. My special guest is a survivor of the 2004 Asian tsunami. She is a dedicated executive transfer, transfer, oh my God, transformation expert specializing in supporting CEOs, founders, and senior executives to increase their productivity tenfold while enhancing their self-care and well-being, ultimately reducing the risk of burnout. Please welcome to the space, Ani Nakvi. How are you? <laughs> Thank you for Very being well, here. Ashley. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a Thank you for... Yes. I mean, thank you for being my first international guest. We got to mark that one down in the book. So <laughs> I'm very blessed to have you um, and just to be in your presence because one, you have an incredible story and um, the, the, I like to tell my guests how I connect with people. So the reason um, how I got connected with you is pretty much you have a third party who reaches out to do your your outreach. And um, fortunately, they found my podcast. And yeah, I was very much interested in your story and the information that they gave me about you. And to know that it is like your whole life has just transformed into something that is really beautiful and you impact thousands of people and i would say even millions going forward because you know that number is going to increase so thank you for being here thank you ashley that's very kind of you to say before we get into of course the obvious of the tsunami which i <clears throat> excuse me which i know you talk about all the time um i want to know about life before the tsunami you know what what was ani doing before the tsunami, what were your goals, maybe personally or professionally, um, before that time? Sure. So I was, you know, I'd already achieved my goals by then. So my goal mm, when I was sorry, okay. when I was a teenager was to become a broadcast journalist, or to you know to be a journalist basically. And so when I graduated from uni, um, I got a job as at the BBC as a, a researcher to begin with and then moved into broadcast journalism journalism so started off as an editorial assistant and was a researcher then kind of moved into the into what I wanted to do and so I'd already sort of achieved my goal at that point in my life and uh, I had become kind of disillusioned with uh, what I thought I wanted to do when I joined, mm. you know, news. And I kind of had this very idealistic view of being able to change the world by bringing the truth into people's homes. And I was inspired by a couple of um, news stories when I was growing up. And then when I was actually working in news, I realized that we don't change anything by reporting on things. Nothing seems to change. And so I found that quite disheartening. And I kind of realized that, that this idealistic view that I had of being able to change the world by bringing the truth into people's homes wasn't really going to, wasn't really kind of how it worked, basically. So, so at this time, just before the tsunami, so I left the BBC in about 2000 and I was in Australia for the millennium and I wanted to, you know, see the new year in, in, in Sydney, which I kind of did. And I also wanted to get a job working at the Sydney Olympics, which I also did. And then after that, I sort of went on a sort of trip you know, traveling around Australia and New Zealand and sort of Asia and places like that. And at the time of the tsunami, I was actually back in the UK after having been traveling around for a year or two. And I was working at uh, the Department of, um, it's called the Department of Justice, it's called now, but it was called something else back then. And I was working there as a kind of project manager that was helping to create a an IT system that was going to allow the police 
services to speak to the probation services to speak to the court services you know so a kind of a system that was going to link everything up so mm. that's kind of what i was doing at the time but i remember this feeling of this kind of feeling of like a, a sort of like a bit of like a depression you know like uh, this sort of feeling of disconnection this malaise this sort of feeling of like is this all there is to life you know, you go to school, you you, you get a mm. go to college, you get a degree, you get a job, mm. and then you kind of do the nine to five or whatever, and then you get married, have a couple of kids, and then you retire, right. and then you die. And I was kind right. of feeling I was having a really major sort of existential crisis at this time in my life because I think I was um, just about to turn thirty, or or had just turned thirty. It was around that sort of time. And so, you know, there's mm. kind of, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're just like, you're just trying to find your way, right? You're just, you're, yeah. you just find your way. You're not really thinking about what's coming next and all that kind of thing. But I think when you start, exactly. yeah, so, you you know, I think when you start to hit 30, you start to think about, well, I don't know, maybe other people don't, but I certainly was having these existential kind of like thoughts and thinking, <clears throat> what is life all about what is the meaning of life and because I'd achieved my goals at such a young age um and then I'd been quite disheartened by by it all I was kind of a bit like well what's next what what is you know and I'd obviously moved I'd moved into the the work that I was doing the pro project work deliberately I am um, you know, I thought, okay, you're not changing the world by reporting on the news. How can you change the world? You can change it by delivering projects that are going to change the world. So that's why I moved into that sort of sector. And then obviously when I was working at this Department of Justice um, project, it felt like it was a, a worthwhile kind of project. But you're so far mm. removed from the results of the the kind of projects that you're delivering and you know uh, government projects they can go on for some time you know so I was just in this state where I was feeling this kind of sense of disconnect and you know a malaise and feeling like what is what is the purpose of life so that's where I was at the time of the yeah. tsunami and I was really looking forward to the holiday because I always found that when I have long trips away, it can really it can bring some excitement back in and some inspiration and all those kind yeah. of things. So yeah, I was really that's... looking forward to the holiday, spending the time with my best friend and just kind of like, you know, I had other, you know, I was, I was there also to plan my own um, land that I had bought the year before. So I was going to be meeting with architects and, designers mm. to develop that as well so that was kind of exciting because that was a project that I was very into you know it was a I had yeah. wanted to create kind of like a retreat environment a set you know a kind of um, yoga meditation like creative music you know like just bringing lots yeah. of, kind of interesting kind of people together and having a very yeah. cozy little kind of um, retreat thing. Obviously, none of that happened because of the tsunami. But that was the intention mm. behind, um, was also part of the intention behind going to Sri Lanka at that time. Yeah, that's, I mean, you out the gate, it sounded like you just had, you, dr you dreamt big. You know, you were like, listen, by 20 something, I'm just going to go full force. And I love that because it shows your strength. You really didn't. I mean, the younger version of you just didn't care. You know, sometimes we get so closed in our box and, you know, we listen to other people and, you know, oh, that won't work out. And, you know, maybe you should do this or that. And, you know, we let other people navigate our path for us. But it's like you came out the doors like, nope. I know I want this. I know I'm going to do this. And you just went for it. And I love that because, listen, we don't take those risks like at all sometimes. And for you, even to get in those positions, you said, no, I'm going to go for it. I see what I want for myself and I'm going to go. So that's amazing. And to do all of that just in your 20s speaks a lot. I, I wish in my 20s I did that um, because I was, I'm not going to say I didn't dream big, but I, I let other people um, um, tell me what I needed to do, or I thought that I couldn't do certain things. So that lights me up. Um, but listen, 
I'm learning that in my 30s now. <laughs> so we're going for it. But that that is amazing to hear. And the one thing that um, I love that you spoke about was really that you want to make more of an impact, right? Like you said, reporting wasn't changing the world. And that's important. It's like you, you know that you're in this profession, not just for the money. It's like, I want to do bigger things. I want to do better things. And I'm here for a reason. Um, but I may not even know what that reason may be, but I just know that it's bigger than money. It's bigger than what is, what is uh, to be materialistic and all the things. So I'm happy that you followed your instinct and your heart. And um, now you are where you are now. Um, so yes, we're going to kind of dive into the tsunami, of course, is that, that is definitely a big part of your life. Um, so during that time, I know you mentioned like signs of like depression. You mentioned like just being in a, like a disconnected phase of just like, I don't know what's coming next. Um, do you feel that the the tsunami was actually, um, it just kind of like, I envision a table, right? You have things on the table, you have it laid out, you have your your job at BBC or your project management. And then the tsunami was like, yep, forget all of that. And it kind of just like shifted you straight into where you are now. Um, do you feel like that was needed for you? I do. And, you know, I, I, I joke, uh, well, I don't joke, but I mean, I say, you know, that I survived three near death experiences. And one of the things that I say to clients is what resists persists. I was not getting the message from the universe from the first three experiences of nearly dying that I w needed to get. And so, you know, the universe will continue to give you the same or similar experience until you learn the lesson that it's trying to teach you. Now, you know, you you say that I was very brave to do what I did when I was in my 20s, but I had to fight against my parents who were very against me being a journalist until the very day that I got a job at the BBC as a broadcast journalist. Mm. And then my father turned around his tune quite quickly and was like, oh, I was very proud that his daughter worked as a BBC broadcast journalist. But I had, you know, they wanted me to go in their direction. Mm. You know, I, I wasn't allowed to do the, the degree that I really wanted to do because, um, you know, they, they kind of, you know, were like, oh, no, don't do that, do this kind of thing. But it was kind of almost that, mm -hmm. um, that rebellion of my father <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of made me do it even more in a way. So, so I have, yeah. him to thank, to have him to thank for that in some respects. <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, in the sort of um, when I was – it did, you know, being in the tsunami, it kind of, one of the things that I really noticed after going back to work after the tsunami, I couldn't do that job anymore, at, you know, that Department of Justice job. I was going there and I was like, I don't understand what the point of all these, it, to me, it felt like a very pointless presentations um, and, you know, working with management consultants and PowerPoints and Excel spreadsheets and all this kind of thing. And I, I kind of was just like, I don't get it anymore. It doesn't make, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It doesn't make any sense to me anymore. So mm. I really struggled with that when, you know, when I initially tried to go back to work. I didn't go back to work for a while. Um, I, and then when I did go back to work, I was, a, I was a working as an independent contractor at the time. So I had my own limited company and I was contracted in to uh, provide services. So, um, and I, I just left after a while I just was like I can't do this it just doesn't mean anything it didn't once you've seen so much death and destruction your life really changes also mm -hmm. that sense of responsibility that I had from the survivor guilt that is quite common that people experience when they've survived something like that and I felt yeah this sense of um responsibility and just needing to create more meaning in my life and needing to create more purpose in my life. And although that sounded like a good thing that I was working on, it, it like I said, all project work for me ended up being, I mean, I ended up in the war in Iraq, you know, um, a few years later. 
also delivering projects to the people oh, wow. who were being displaced by the war because you know I thought okay well if it's not this Department of Justice you know how else can it be and one of the things I'd always always wanted to do as a journalist was be a foreign correspondent and I'd left before I realized that dream and so Mm -hmm. but one of the other ways is you know you see these people going into Gaza for example you know all these um I mean, not a lot of people are getting into Gaza to to deliver aid, but it's the sort of the same sort of thing. You know, yeah. you've got a non-government organisation that is. You know, we were not based in the green zone, so not like all the other people that were based in the green zone. We were in the red zone in Baghdad, trying to deliver mm. projects and programs to the people that are being displaced by the war. But un- unfortunately. Uh, you know, you're so far removed, you know, because of it, we, we weren't allowed out because of the risk of kidnapping and the risk of the threat to us. It was still quite big at that time. It was still 2007, 2008. So it was really in the full kind of um, mm. swing of war. So there was a lot of danger for foreign nationals there and all that kind of thing. Um, but even that yeah. felt too far removed from the results of what you're trying to do. You know, you're just sort of sitting in an office and creating all these projects, and but you're not sort of seeing the result of them, so to speak. <clears throat> so even that didn't feel like it was it was there for me in terms of being able to see that kind of that change, that transformation, that impact that I was kind of looking for in a way. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm, I'm just kind of speechless because you, you, you are placed in these environments where, like you said, it's nothing but destruction, right? There's nothing but kind of like a little bit of chaos and just, um, death ultimately. Right. So have you been, have you taken just your role in this and, in being able to heal yourself from these experiences, um, because I know it's not easy, you know, it, you, you internalize a lot of this, right. I would assume. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yes, I want to get the work done, but on a, still on an emotional level, it still impacts you. You know, you're a human being. You're like, I'm seeing all of this. I'm in the midst of this. I am a survivor. Um, and you know, rest in peace and to the families and the loved ones. Um, I mean, to the ones that have been affected by the tsunami, um, back in 2004 because I mean at that point I I was I was very much a little kid back then I didn't even know that happened but just to hear the stories and read about it I'm like wow and to see the footage I can't even imagine how especially you feel about that um so how now that you're in the midst of everything and just the war the tsunami and everything how have you been healing yourself during during this process well, I think that's why the cancer came along, right? So um, a couple of years after the Iraq war, about six years after the tsunami, I developed a cancer diagnosis. And I think that was my my spirit's final way of saying to me, okay, this is your last chance, right? We've been giving you all these short, sharp shocks mm. to these near-death experiences. And you're not getting the lesson. So now we're giving you a slightly less kind of like in your face near death experience and a bit more of a you know a flirtation with death um and mm. see what you make of this now <clears throat> and so it was really through that journey of uh, the cancer diagnosis and 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 really understanding on a deep level intuitively that i believe that you know when everything is right in the mind body spirit kind of can you know kind of um you know, which aura, whatever you want to call it, you know, energetic field, then there is not disease, not disease is not going to happen, right? Unless you're old, okay? And when you're old, it's different because your body's Mm. degenerating and that kind of thing. So if you're older Mm -hmm. than that, you know, then that's different. But otherwise, it's something that you've kind of created or that you've given the environment for to kind of be there. And it didn't, you know, it wasn't Mm. a massive surprise to me to get, I mean, it was a shock because I was young, so I wasn't expecting it. But then when I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, you know, you you spent a lot of your time being quite depressed, Annie. You spent quite a lot of your time not really wanting to be here, haven't you? Mm. You spent quite a lot of your time entertaining negative thoughts and negativity. So when I kind of, you know, confronted the real truths, 
I thought to myself, well, if you do believe in the mind body spirit connection, which I do, of course, when you have entertaining all the negative thoughts and the thoughts of not really wanting to be here and what's the point of life and all of you know that for like long periods of time then your body will respond as well okay and Mm. you will start to create what your mind is kind of thinking about but at the same time what that did was it made me have a lot of faith that if I had created something or that cancer was as a result of some of the unreleased trauma and traumatic events that I'd been through, whether it was the tsunami, whether it was other near-death experiences, whether it was other experiences, that the only way to heal would be to dive in deep to all of those things and to look at mind, body and spirit and heal on all three levels. And Mm. so that's what I kind of committed to doing. Um, You know, and don't get me wrong, I was nowhere near as zen as I am now about it. I was (laughs) a complete mess at the time with panic stations and, you know, all sorts of things. But I was blessed that I I had either engineered it in this way or the universe had engineered it in this way that my husband came into my life one month before my diagnosis. And he Mm. was like a guardian angel or my guardian angel sent him because he was exactly what I needed to to help me overcome that period of my t- of my life because he was mm. a yoga teacher meditation instructor and I Vedic consultant and dabbled in astrology and all sorts of other things and but very unassuming with it all I mean you wouldn't get him on a podcast for example um he's very <laughs> quiet and Aww. keeps himself to himself and you know is mm. is kind of like comfortable with who he is without needing to you know to share it with other people necessarily but in five years Mm. of going to a yoga philosophy chat that he he used to host at this place that I met him which was a holiday resort in five years we lived there and for five years for six months every year and I would go to his chat every week and in the five Mm. years of of seeing him deliver these chats there was never a question that he didn't know the answer to when it was getting into oh. philosophy. That's how in depth his knowledge is. Not just about yoga, but in yeah. all sorts of topics, you know, random topics, yeah. topics like languages or, you know, um history or other things. Anyway, so he came into my life and he really sort of really helped um me. You know, I left all work at that time. I left the kind of job that I, the jobs that I was doing. And I, we, you know, I rented my house out a lot of the time, some of the time in the UK. And then we would just go traveling abroad and sort of looking for alternative and holistic therapies. And Mm. I just did a lot of work on diving into all of these different areas and, you know, started Mm. off with the physical body, you know, with them cleaning up my act, you know, sort of eating more healthily, getting more rest you know, trying to reduce Mm. stress levels. And I worked on um, the kind of mind stuff as well. And then obviously the um, spiritual stuff and the soulful stuff as well to really kind of like, Mm. and it meant that I had to do a lot of work diving into the past to look at some things that I was holding on to and to, you know, um, create forgiveness for my parents who I was very angry with before that. Uh, all sorts of different things that I had to do in order to mm. to really kind of um, heal myself, really. And obviously, you know, um, in that process, I did a number of different qualifications, not necessarily to be a practitioner in anything, but for my own healing and for my own well-being. And so whatever I was kind of doing, whether it was yoga, meditation, mindfulness, Ayurveda, NLP, hypnotherapy, EFT, Reiki, whatever I was doing, I then sort of trained in and was able to do it for myself. And so I kind of came out of this five year journey with a stage four. I mean, it was a stage four diagnosis at one point, but I've been in remission now without doing Mm. chemo for the last 10 years. I've got two recurrences in that time. And I was like, oh my God, what Mm. is the lesson now that I'm supposed to be learning? And then I realized it was that I was like, (laughs) control things too much. And then I had to let go and I had to surrender. 
so honestly I was like so many lessons but yeah I'm really grateful for all the experiences I've had in my life because I have grown so much as a result of those experiences which I wouldn't have done if I hadn't have had those experiences and I've managed to convert them mm. into gifts and I've and turn them into opportunities and you know abilities to be able to help other people with their challenges or their struggles so that they don't end up um, in the same position as me which is uh, yes. you know, with a cancer diagnosis in my 30s from not really paying attention to that spiritual part of me that was having those existential crises but then not really doing I thought I was doing what I could about it but obviously I wasn't I, I was still not pointing in the right direction so it was really after yeah. that that's when I kind of made this foray into coaching and that again was happened really organically because um, I was just supporting people with everything that I knew just like you know people gravitated to me for some support and advice over the years after the cancer story and everything and it was a, a conversation with one of those people that mm -hmm. brought me on to the coaching side of things where she said to me that the support and advice I'd been giving her had been more helpful than her qualified American therapist and that's when I had my light bulb moment of of course Ali mm. you've been through all of these tragedies and all of this like hardship of course you're supposed to be doing something for other people um, but it took a long time to get there it's, and it's so funny actually mm. because I very very nearly studied psychology at university and I didn't study psychology and <laughs> of now course. I'm like <laughs> That was what I was supposed to study. That was what I was meant to be doing um, because yeah. I've ended up in that field anyway. Right. Like, so, but it's funny because yeah. it was between. Look how life... I know it's funny how life goes, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I like, I was writing down some points as you were talking and um, the first thing I want to say is that, of course, like things happen spiritually before they happen physically. So, you know, even, you know, when we first started talking about your 20s, things were still coming out in this, from the spiritual to the physical. And then, like you said, things just gradually, like, increased, increased, increased. And then until so your dashboard was like, listen, we got, we have to do something. Let's, let's, let's do something. Like, you have to make a change. Um, and I, I love that you were able to, like you said, your husband came in as a guardian, well, from your guardian angel or as a guardian angel. And it's exactly what you needed. Um, because of what I was going to ask you, and you kind of like answered it anyway. Um, well, did he influence you to be a coach? Because um, it seemed like he had everything lined up and he was giving you the information. So I wondered if he influenced you um, to be a coach as well. Um, and just the fact that you know, to even get your, all your uh, certifications or other, you know, uh, credentials as well. Was he part of that? Uh, he, he was, look, he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't really know what coaching was. Neither of us did, to be honest, back then, you know, we're talking about like eight years ago where oh, it was okay. not very well as known as it is now. And, um, but, you know, he did fund a lot of my courses for me at that time because he was the one that was earning the money at the time. And, you know, when, when I said to him, I want to do this coaching qualification, he, 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 he was the one that funded it for me. He said, yeah, I support you with whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, Ashley, he was yeah. my coach, I would say. You know, he was the one yeah. that pointed out the things to me. And I learned a lot through him. Uh, I learned the, you know, and also being in stage four, you have to learn how to be, live in the present moment because otherwise you're going to yeah. drive yourself insane, right? So it was something that I needed to to master. And he really was, you know, a really great teacher and, um, you know, person that kind of, like I said, came into my life. You know, he was so grounded. Even when, when I got diagnosed, his, you know what his response was? Mm -hmm. You know, he caught, he was just like, it's okay. These things happen. Everything will be okay. He's Italian, so I'm just trying mm. to make his accent. And yeah, it was okay. exactly what I needed to hear as opposed to 
my family yeah like oh my god oh what's happened oh da, 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 da. like totally dramatic and like you know over the top sort of yeah I'm not, sure it's not a dramatic thing but you don't want to you don't need that when you're when you're going through something like that what you need is right someone who's really laid back and chilled out well I didn't know what I needed until it came along and then I was like you know he just made me feel like it wasn't a big deal and that everything was going to be okay yeah and that that's how he made yeah. me feel there was no and, and considering mm. he'd only been with me for a month uh you know he could have run a mile but he yeah did. yeah um, he yeah, yeah. Um, he that's great was amazing you know he was an amazing support yeah an amazing kind of coach for me in terms of teaching me so many things about meditation and mindfulness and ayurveda and yoga and all sorts of other things that he you know that he he's taught me along the way and vice versa as well yeah yeah i think you guys make the perfect partners i mean this, this is from what it sounds like it's like y'all just are made to be together um i'm a lover girl so i'm sorry i love love and when i hear stories about like how people get together and it just lines up that way it just makes my heart flutter so i'm sorry <laughs> Yes. over here gushing no, but sure. <laughs> don't be sorry I mean, but a romantic story you know i met him on a on a holiday yeah. to greece while i was going on a yoga on a yoga holiday and he was one of the yoga teachers i mean it's quite romantic and then yeah. i ended up not leaving the country for a month and then he came to um visit me and it was the same day that he arrived in london that he i got my diagnosis so everything the, the mm. whole thing lined up so you couldn't have you couldn't yeah. have timed it any better really um and yeah, um, well, yeah that's and awesome he's, he's got this, yeah he's got the same birthday as my dad and my dad has um um uh, passed away like a week what? after my diagnosis so it was just like crazy you know oh yeah wow wow yeah well, I am happy that you that you were able to at least get through that portion of your life with someone who was very supportive and yes. still supportive to this day, I'm sure. So yes, he is. Um, for I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, I know we talked about meditation um, as one of your um, key techniques or practices that you use. Do you have any mindset strategies that you um, use yourself? and or use with your clients when you coach um, that could be more beneficial beneficial for users, uh, for, for listeners, I would say, um, that may have not really encountered um, this, this yet. Because like, I, what I mean is like listeners who are looking to change their mindset and transform their mindset, but not really sure where to start. Like what strategies would you suggest? Absolutely. So we've got a saboteurs. Okay. So there's a self-sabotaging quiz on my website. Please, um, you know, if you're listening and you want to go and do that, ultimateresultsgroup.com, it's, it's free to, to do the quiz. But we all have self-sabotaging voices in our head. Okay. And we tend to think that these voices are us, but they're not us. And so I want everybody to go away and breathe a nice big sigh of relief. Was that negative voice that is telling you that all oh, the weather is crap and the and your boyfriend is is bad and your you know this is and your job is terrible and all that kind of thing that we all say to each other all the time. It's not mm. you. They're your saboteurs. All right. Well, you're not born with those voices when you're when you're you know you're not born with those negative voices you pick them up as time goes on as you know you call yourself a divine glow coach right we are all born a divine mm -hmm. glow okay we're all born a divine yeah. beings these beautiful uh, glowing beings okay and then what happens along the way is through our formative years we start to absorb the information that we hear from our surroundings, whether it's your parents or whether it's the TV or video games or the teachers at school or the bullies at school or just the people that are in your environment. You know, um, whatever you're consuming, like watching, reading, <laughs> listening, it then becomes part of who you become. Let's say you have parents. I've got a client, uh, um, I had a client, a really amazing client, whose parents grew him up telling them, him that he was crushing it the whole time. You're crushing it. 
So guess how, <laughs> guess what that, what he's like now as a 28, 29 year old. Yeah, he's crushing it. All he's right. He's crushing it, right? Well, he's already, he's yeah. Already, he's already at C suite level, okay? Because yes. his parents told him he was crushing it the whole time. Now, imagine yeah. your parents that tell you that you're stupid and you're fat and you're ugly and you're never going to make anything of yourself. What's their experience of life going to be like? It's going to be the opposite. Very right? much the opposite. Exactly. Yeah. It's the opposite. So, um, you know, whatever you heard when you're young forms part of all of your limiting uh, your limiting beliefs as well as your beliefs. So, if, you know, in his, in the first case, they're not limiting. They're like, okay, you can do everything and anything you want to. Um, yeah. But in other cases, they kind of create your limiting beliefs. And they also your self-sabotaging um, voices that are part of your survival mechanism, okay? We all have them. Um, not a single person in the world doesn't mm -hmm. have self-sabotaging voices um, because they are developed in those formative years as a coping mechanism to survive your childhood but unfortunately what happens is we hold on to these negative voices yeah. throughout our life and we think that they're us we think that oh I'm such a depressing unhappy miserable person why can't I just be happy that's what I used to think to myself like why can't I just be happy what's wrong right. with me and it's not, it wasn't me. I mean, mm -hmm. it was me, but it wasn't really me because we're also pre-programmed for what's called the negativity bias. And the negativity yes. bias yes. is um, the the fact that we, uh, um, ha we index on the one negative thing that's happened or uh, we, we think about the negative experiences or the painful experiences have more impact than the positive ones do. Now, this is part of our evolution. Our ancestors needed to know which was the poisonous snake more than they needed to know which was the pretty butterfly. So that's part of the survival mechanism that our ancestors had was to remember the negative things. But this mm -hmm. is why most people will err on the side of negativity. Not everybody, of course, but a lot of people will err on the side of negativity without even realizing it. So unless yeah. you know that, you don't know what you're supposed to do with it. So my point is here, first of all, be aware that there is a negativity bias. Secondly, be aware that you have self-sabotaging thoughts that create your emotions and your feelings. I believe that we are what we think. We can create our reality with the quality of the thoughts that we give our attention and our focus to. So. If you have a negative thought, just you don't need to believe it just because you think it doesn't make it true. We have up to 100,000 thoughts a day, some researchers have said. Most of those thoughts are running in the unconscious, mm -hmm. in the background, and they're driving your life. And unless you bring it into the conscious, um, then they will drive your life and you will call it fate. That's a quote from Carl Jung there. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can yeah. basically... Choose which thoughts you give your time and your energy to, to. Let's say, for example, your thought comes along, my boss is going to fire me. How is that a helpful thought for you? It's not really very helpful, no. is it? So you let that thought go. And you, so these are, the, the, these are some tools and some tricks for your, for your listeners. First of all, do the three ends. Notice it, name it, neutralize it. So first you notice it. Oh, my saboteur is telling me that I'm going to get fired tomorrow. Name it. So you've named it. You've said my saboteur. Okay. There are a bunch of different types of saboteurs. You know, uh, I'll mention a few of the ones that should be easy for your listeners to pick up on. Um, we've got the the inner critic, the judge, but it's not just the inner critic. It's also the judge of others. And we also judge circumstances and situations as well. So the judge is one of the main, is the main master saboteur. But then we've got the controller. We've got um, the, um, you know, the victim mindset. We've got the people pleaser. We've got the overachiever. We've got the um, mm -hmm. controller. You know, so these are some kind of common yeah. saboteurs that you can, if you don't know which one it is, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You I just, actually took the quiz uh, or assessment uh, not too long ago, and I'm a stickler. <laughs> I'm, I'm a stickler and controller. And I was like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. So, but it's, it's really a helpful tool 
Um, and I, I really love that you also use it. Um, I, th- there's so many um, assessments out there, but not quite like that I've come across, but mm-hmm. it's really helpful because we focus so much on the strengths, right, of us and like, oh, we're an advocate or we're this and we're that, like personality tests and all these things. But let's get down and talk about what our critics or our weaknesses are, right? Like we have to see the other side of that just to make things make sense for us and what we need to let go of versus holding on to, because our strengths are our strengths. Like we want to capitalize on our strengths, but how about our weaknesses and what we need to like improve on and, you know, a little pivot. Exactly. So that's what you can, you can figure out, right? So that when you do the noticing, the naming and the neutralizing, you're then not giving that, um, that saboteur any airtime basically. So that's one trick yeah. you can kind of use your listeners can use to be able to help with that but the thing is is most people won't recognize or won't notice that these things <laughs> unless they work with a coach because you can't tell what your language is until someone's observing it so it's like I had a girl that came around to do my uh you know a girl that came around to do my hair and, and stuff yesterday and the first thing that she said to me when I told her I was going on holiday to Colombia tomorrow, she was like, she was like, oh, I saw this thing about um, this person, about this city in Brazil, which is right next to the Amazon. And, you know, I just, I would never be able to go there. What about all the dead bodies that would be, that would be in the Amazon? And I was thinking to myself, God, her mind went into the darkest of places. <laughs> One reference. I'm going on holiday to Colombia. Oh my gosh, there's a city that's right next to the Amazon in Brazil. Right. Like there must be so many dead bodies. I mean, that's like okay. I was thinking to myself, yeah, um, you yeah, need to coach because that. But you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily pick up on that, right? Unless um unless you right. work as a coach because people talk like that all the time and they don't think there's anything wrong with it. They don't yeah. notice the language that they're using with themselves. Yeah, because I mean, sometimes it's like people are just saying, hey, I'm just saying this information. This is something that you may need to know or, you know, or if it's something that they know they just want to share. Mm-hmm. It's like, I, I just want to enjoy my vacation and my holiday. Like, I just I wasn't then, thinking about dead bodies. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I was thinking, you need to provide a service to me and you're talking about dead bodies in the Amazon. Yeah. What I mean, I I mean, I made <laughs> laugh at these things, right? And I just was amused, right? But I mean, imagine yeah, if but... I was a bit more freaked out. Somebody that did get like easily, um, you know, what's the word? Triggered in like, a way, yeah, easily influenced yeah. by someone else. You need to be careful about what you're saying to people sometimes. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if you if you were that person, but like, yeah, I'm not going to Colombia. We could cancel the flight. We could cancel the whole trip. But that's that's. That's from zero to 100, but it's okay. <laughs> but I, that's important, though. I, I, I love the fact that um, what I, I meant to mention before was that just cutting out the distractions, right? Like, um, that's a big part of not only for personal development, but also for our spiritual journey. Um, for me personally, when I, I know we talk about awakenings, and I, I used to talk about them a lot. Um just back in 2018, 2021, like that period, big awakening for me. Um, everything shifted in the way of like the people around me. I had to really change up like the eating, the way I was eating, um, being more intentional about the music I listen to. Am I watching TV? Not really. And if I am watching TV, being mindful about what I'm watching, um, the podcast, the books I'm reading, like you name it, like whatever is entering exactly. your your mind, you, you know, you have to be mindful of that. I remember um, there would be certain things that I listened to while I was sleeping and you think, you know, okay, I'm sleeping. It's not really going into my brain or anything, but no, your subconscious, yeah. whatever you could be, you could be watching a horror movie going to sleep. Do not do that. <laughs> I do not do that. Do not go to sleep watching a horror movie because your subconscious is is picking up all of that. And then now you're you're in your wakeful state, your conscious state, and then you're you're wondering like, okay, why is this why why is something feeling right? Or you're like you're sometimes you even get some small anxiety, I feel like, that can manifest into the physical state. 
but it's just certain things that people need to be aware of. And I, I love that. Um, I always love the conversation of just stripping away what we, we know to be, or we think is okay to listen to or to watch, but you have to know that everything is in, we're like a sponge, you know, we're a sponge. So whatever we are ingesting, taking in is going to affect us not only on a spiritual level, but on a physical level. Um, and I, I think about the people that, um, I don't want to say complain. I don't know what other word to use right now, because I feel like when people complain, right, you're, you're harnessing that negative energy. It's like, like, I think you were saying before, I don't like this. I don't like that. Da, 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 da. Like all in the drama. And then you wonder why you're breaking down physically or you're stressed or you're like, a lot of things are going on. There's a lot of chaos going on. Um, I just think it's just, just to be more mindful of that. Exactly. I mean, think about it like this. If you spend 70% of your day going around complaining about things, what is the environment that you're creating within your body? Yeah. You know, think about, you know, every time you are complaining or you're a bit dissatisfied with something or that you're annoyed about something, you're creating a biochemical response within the body, okay, that is, you know, setting off stress hormones or um, the sympathetic nervous system and all these sort of things. And so what that does over a period of time is it creates chronic stress in the body. And whatever's going on in your mind will reflect into your body eventually. So, you know, there's been lots of books that they've written about this sort of topic now you know I'm not the first person that said this and I'm not going to be the last but Mm -hmm. there really is a link between that so we have to be extremely mindful of being resilient mentally and being mentally fit as I call it so it just in the same way that the doctor says we need to do 30 minutes of physical exercise a day in order to be mentally fit. So that means a mental and emotional well-being where you're feeling peace, joy, contentment, happiness, all of these types of things 80% of the time and you're getting hijacked by your subatols 20% of the time because that's about as good as we're going to get it, right? We can't get rid of them completely. And Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with having, quote unquote, negative emotions. We need all of the emotions, but we don't need to spend a lot of time hanging out in those negative emotions. Um, But imagine that you spend that 80% of the time feeling those peace, joy and harmony. We're also, that means that you're mentally fit and you've got resilience to deal with life's challenges with a positive mindset rather than a negative mindset. It also means that you live 10 years longer. So Mm. just think about that. And it's actually more important than physical fitness, I would say, than physical well-being. Being mentally well is more important, mentally, emotionally, mentally fit is more important than physical fitness. You can be a triathlete, Mm. but you can still suffer from really bad anxiety, for example. And that anxiety can eat you up. And I, I know a triathlete that died of cancer, for example. And that kept that that and she used to be very, very anxious. And so I'm sure that part of part of it was that that anxiety kind of ate away and on the inside sort of thing. So it really yeah. does, you know, make a difference for you to be mentally well. I mean, I know people that have smoked and drank all their life. Right. But because they have a very sort of like glasses half full kind of approach to life, they're still going in their 90s you know still drinking and smoking like, yeah like uh, you know yeah so all these sort of things that we think are going to I'm not say, saying go out and drink and smoke and do all those kind of things what I'm saying is that you know working on your mental fitness is really the most important thing for you to do and to feel yeah. that joy and that happiness and fulfillment and satisfaction and contentment in life that's the aim if you can get there um, and, um, you know, and it's, it's a, achievable for everybody. Yeah. I mean, your brain is a muscle too. I think we forget that. <laughs> so yeah. we have to work just like we working on the glutes and the hamstrings and the biceps and everything. We got to work on our mind. So exactly. I, I agree. 
Um, before we uh, start wrapping up here, I definitely want to um, go into two segments with you. Um, so I have one segment called the Empowerment EP segment. So I have a playlist of songs on Apple Music and on Spotify. And each guest that comes on the show, they share with me three songs that have served a like a source of strength or inspiration for them on their journey. It doesn't have to, it, it could be old, it could be new, but um, I put these three songs added onto the playlist. So this playlist serves as a source of, of course, strength and inspiration for other people. If they need some empowerment, some tunes to listen to while they get their day started or just need to pick me up during the day, you know, they could pop on the playlist. So I know it's sometimes hard for people to pick three songs, but if you just have one, that's okay too. But um, what are your songs? So my three songs that I like the most or my three songs that are, of, tell me tell me again what you want. Sorry. So the, no, it's okay. Um, your three songs that serve as a source of strength and inspiration to you on your journey. Well, it's funny because one of my friends dedicated the Chumbawamba song, I Get Knocked Down, But I Get Up Again. Oh. You're never going to keep me down. Oh. Years ago, right? So she dedicated that to me years ago. She was like, that's your song, Annie. And it's like, I don't I think I've heard down, that. Down, but I get up again and they're never going to oh. keep me down, that one. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I remember, remember that, that one. I like yes. yes. I <laughs> it was a big kind of like, you know, anthem a few many years ago now. So that's one I yeah. would say. Um, Right, my second song okay. is um, "I Feel I Feel Love." That's one of my favorite tunes, and mm -hmm. it always makes me feel very happy when I listen to that song. And then, oh, there's so many. Um, the third one I would say is "I Really Like Happiness" by Pharrell Williams. <laughs> the despicable me i think it's a despicable oh, okay. me song um but those it's kind the, of oh the ha ha like i'm so happy like that, that one that one yeah 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 guy i haven't heard that song in forever they used to play that non-stop non-stop but yeah that's a good one um it's like definitely a pick-me-up song it's but a yeah I, song, I love your yeah. i love your um range huh Thanks. Up your ranges. So, um, so that it's a definitely a pick me up song. The ones that I really listen to on a loop at the moment are the happiness one. Then there's the J Justin Timberlake one. Um, uh, I can't stop that feeling. Can't stop that. Oh, okay, feeling, that one. I've yeah, really got it into gotcha. it. I never used to be okay. a fan of pop music in the past. Um, I always used to kind of be more on the, you know, on on different sort of music and everything, but. Yeah, I like, I yeah. like to make me feel happy now. So I've got some tunes that I play all the time that make me feel happy. Yeah. Nice. Do you, are, are you a Apple Music uh, listener or a Spotify listener? Spotify. Yeah, definitely. I feel like everybody's a Spotify user. Um, I don't know. I have like, I'm mostly in the Apple Music world, I guess because I pay for it. <laughs> so I'm like, if I pay for it, let me use it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I hear that Spotify has a better mix. Like if you listen to a song, then, you know, See, it, Apple it kind of is, flows. I think Apple music is better for the, um, because you're paying for it. So you're paying for the artists, I think a bit more than Spotify. I mean, I've got friends who are musicians who don't get any money when they put their music on Spotify. And that's the problem with Spotify, yeah. unfortunately. But I think from a yeah. point, from a point of perspective of us as consumers, it's it's quite easy to jump onto Spotify and get your playlists and everything. That's true. That's true. So we're gonna just go into our next segment. I call it "Shine the Light on Them," and "Shine the Light on Them" is a section of the show where you can show gratitude and appreciation for people in your life. Um, it could be one person. It could be a couple people. You decide, but this is your time to just show appreciation and gratitude for whoever you choose in this space. Who do I want to shine a light on, did you say? Mm-hmm. Yes. When you, like, <laughs> oh gosh, you're really putting me on the spot here. Um, um, oh, 
this could be like, hey, I'm giving appreciation or gratitude for my husband or my, I don't know, my mother or just a, like anybody in your circle that yeah. you want to just share appreciation for. I mean, although I feel like yeah. I've already given him appreciation, but I'll give him some more appreciation. Yeah, he's he's the person that I would say I want to give appreciation yeah. to. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I was I was gonna say you've been shouting him out all episode. I think that would be the one yeah. <laughs> that you would say. So but yeah, I yeah. I always have a um a section in the show because I feel like it's important for us to show appreciation and gratitude, um, not just for ourselves, but for other people as well. Um, I think the only time that we do say it or Maybe not at all, but the most of the time when we do say it, right, we we are accepting an award. We're accepting, uh, we're just doing our speech for something. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like we should be doing that every day. We should be doing that every day because we don't know, um, you know, how long they're going to be here. We, we don't know how long we're going to be here. So it's like, why not just give them their flowers and show them their love while we're here, you know, Absolutely. in the moment. So. So um, please, before we go, tell the listeners, because you, you were very gracious and you gave us a, um, a link to your free gift. So can you let the listeners know what that is and um, what can they expect from this gift? So I'm giving your listeners a link to a free yoga nidra download meditation. It's a lying down guided visualization and meditation that if you... <clears throat> it's good to do before bedtime and if you have any issues with sleeping because nidra means sleep in sanskrit so it's and it's lying down and it's me that's guiding it as well so it's um i think you've got the link it's ultimate results group forward slash yo free yoga nidra meditation i think is the link but it, it'll be in the um mm -hmm. It'll be um, linked in the yeah. podcast, right? So uh, just in case. There's yes, some, yes, it'll be in the show notes. There's some dashes and some forward slashes I've probably missed there. But um, but you'll be able to get that. <laughs> it's okay. Free of charge. I got you. Just, just um, yeah, so that you can you know, have, a, have a few minutes of peace and harmony in your life. Yes. Did you do this originally um, for yourself, the meditation? Did you like record it for yourself at first? Well, actually, my husband had recorded one for me many years ago, which I did religiously every day, which was specifically for healing me from cancer. And then when I started to sort of do this work myself, I recorded my own yoga nidra meditation, which was actually for my clients. I do do. I've done it myself many times as well. Um, and uh, but I kind of did it for, gotcha. I did it, recorded it for my, for my clients to begin with. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, um, I will also, I think you are on LinkedIn, right? You're on LinkedIn, you're on Facebook. Am I missing anything yep. else where they can connect you? LinkedIn, with you? Facebook, Instagram. And that's it. And Instagram. Not, yes. I, in I did follow you on Instagram. You do? Okay, great. <laughs> Good to know. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> I'm on Instagram, Annie.Nakvi. I'm, I'm Annie Nakvi. A-N-I is my first name. N-A-Q-V-I is my surname. On LinkedIn and Facebook, feel free to connect with me. If you're connecting with me on Facebook, best to just send me a little message to say, I heard you on a podcast because I get a lot of um, requests and they're not necessarily all nice requests. So, so just make sure that yeah. I know who you are to connect with me there if you're connecting me, with me there. Yeah. Yes. And guys, all of this will be down in the show notes, um, including the free gift um, for you guys. Um, and thank you so much, um, Annie, for coming on. I'm so happy of this conversation. It filled me up. See, like I, your see, your day is already started, but my day, because it's already <laughs> I don't know what time it is, nine o'clock. You you set me on the right track for today. So I, I'm very grateful for you. Um, and uh, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Your Divine Glow Podcast. I'm truly grateful for you guys for listening and tuning in every other week. Um, please catch me on, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe, 
hit that notification bell. And of course, like the video, please, if you made it this far. Um, but I will catch you guys in the next episode. And until next time, continue to let your divine glow shine, babies. See you next time.